I would love to introduce you to my good friend and moderator, filmmaker, founder of Shift.com, Peter Glatzer. Thank you. Um, so, how the impact of our energy usage can save humanity. That's quite a title. Um, <laughs> it sounds like an action movie more than a panel. But um, we are uh, going to bring that down to earth a little bit. The planet, as we know, as, uh, faces challenges from climate change, from pollution, other environmental issues. Um, and these challenges also present, on the other hand, um, a tremendous opportunity for clean energy um, and the technology, the finance, and the policy that go along with it. So in this panel, I think we're going to try to tackle two themes. One, just how the economy around clean energy and, and where we are right now, kind of a snapshot of where we are right now, which is actually there's a lot of good news there. Um, and the other is environmental justice and um, how we how we can create energy for all. Um, and this is a global thing, not just a local thing. Um, but before we dive in, I'd like to introduce this ter terrific panel. Uh, first, we have Mike Hart, who's the president and CEO of Sierra Energy, to my immediate left. Um, Michelle Romero, who's the deputy director at Green for All. Uh, David Absher is the senior manager for environmental sustainability for, to to for Toyota of North America. Uh, Abigail Dillon is the Vice President of Litigation for Climate and Energy at Earth Justice. And finally, Mike Sullivan, who's the President of LA Car Guy. Um, I'd like everyone to just tell a little bit about yourself and, and the work you're doing, briefly. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I'm, I'm the CEO of uh, Sierra Energy, but the way that started was um, I'm also the CEO of Sierra Railroad Company, California's oldest private railroad. And uh, back in 2001, I wanted to find a way to reduce emissions from locomotives. So we became the first railroad in the world to run on 100% biodiesel. And I then had my environmental friends look at me with horror and they say, well, you know that comes from food, don't you? So we realized that we had to find a better solution. So instead of coming from soybeans, for example, working with UC Davis, we came up with a way to make diesel out of garbage. And the way we did that was by taking the garbage gasifying it, taking that gas and shifting it to diesel that's 20 times cleaner than the California fuel standard. So Sierra Railroad Company became the leader in making something happen by partnering with UC Davis, the California Energy Commission, and the Department of Defense to actually design this technology, which is now being commissioned in Monterey. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm Michelle Romero, and you all heard Van Jones speak a little while ago about how he created this organization called Green for All. I am just the lucky one who gets to help um, as part of the team and helping lead his vision and into implementation. And so um, at Green for All, we are turning 10 this year. And when we started, or when Van started Green for All about 10 years ago, uh, the green economy was only burgeoning, right? People hadn't really ever heard of green jobs, we helped to popularize that concept and pass green jobs legislation all over the country. And today, we're seeing a growing green economy. But we're still seeing barriers to bringing that green economy to some of the poorest and most polluted communities uh, in the country. And the fact is, low-income communities and people of color are living on the front lines of some of the worst pollution in America. 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal plant. In uh, Brandywine, Maryland, a community in Prince George's County, they have, it's a predominantly African American community, and they have three power plants and two more in development, all surrounding their community, right? And so what we're doing is trying to figure out how do we bring the green economy to these communities, right? How do we make it so that frontline families aren't bearing the cost of the pollution, but the polluters are paying? And how do we invest in the solutions like electric vehicles and solar for affordable housing and things like that? So I'm really excited to talk more about how we can work together to create an inclusive green economy for all. Hello, I'm David Absher with Toyota. I'm the 
manager for environmental sustainability for North America, and I work directly with the environmental director for uh, sustainability in North America. Uh, about five years ago, Toyota took a look at the way we were doing business with regards to environmental sustainability and decided that we did need to form a, a, a team to collaborate across all functions in, in uh, United States, Canada, and Mexico to bring things forward that we'd been considering for several years. One of those things was what ultimately became the 2050 environmental challenge that my colleague Mark mentioned this morning. And so uh, the North American environmental sustainability team worked with uh, all of the environmental directors around the globe so that Toyota could bring forth the global environmental challenge. And we have a one sustainability mission now that we're implementing around the world. Happy to be here today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abby Dillon. I'm really honored to be on this panel. Um, I um, made an ill-considered decision to go to law school about 20 years ago, and by some lucky stroke of fate, I um, ended up doing a summer of work at Earth Justice, and I've been there ever since. Um, we're a public interest, uh, nonprofit law organization. I think that big mouthful can be best summarized by our tagline, which is, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. And it, it does now more than ever. I direct our climate and energy program, so um, I have the privilege of working with 100 plus lawyers, a communications team with an incredible storytelling talent, and a team in Washington, D.C. who do legislative advocacy work there and now in the states, um, working to get us off of fossil fuels toward 100% clean energy. Hi, I'm Mike Sullivan. About 20 years ago, I started introducing myself as LA car guy, and I actually do that as much as Mike anymore. Um, I got in the car business 40 years ago, and it was really a ripe place to start. It was a, a good, dirty industry. Everything I did was, was a, a positive change. There was hardly anything I could do from a green standpoint that didn't help. As a kid, I'd grown up uh, surfing and diving in Malibu and had kind of a natural awareness of the environment. I just remember starting out 30 years ago with you know, separating uh, two, you know, having two trash bins as my original, and, a, and, a, and a, a brick in my toilet to save water, and I was doing my part. And over the years, I found that I could have a little bigger um, influence, and uh, so I really focused on environmentally friendly products, cars that we sell. Started out with a, a small demograph of about 12 people, like Ed Bagley and his, his neighbors, whereas my original group of, uh, of suspects, and um, became the largest hybrid dealer in the world, and now the, the, there's two of us that represent Mariah for, the, for Los Angeles County. So, and I found that through education and, and, and work, hard, I could, I could be the guy that made it easy to change, whether it was um, free charging stations or uh, whatever we did to, to help educate kids before they developed bad habits. So had a really a great opportunity to, to become kind of an educator and motivator and, and step into a, uh, a void that was, uh, that was not there before um, uh, Debbie and several of us kind of started attacking it. So thanks. Thanks. Um, what an esteemed group of people we've got here. Um, first question I'd like to dive into, the first area really, um, is, is the, the price point. I mean, that's what's really driving everything, right? Um, and the cost of solar has reached parity, I think, in California now, Arizona, New Mexico, other states, uh, wind is comparable in some cases, uh, even lower. Um, Mike, why, I'd love you to speak a little bit to the economic perspective that you've seen with the work you're doing. Sure. I think the thing to keep in mind is green energy has always been less expensive than dirty energy. Nobody ever just monetized it. Nobody considered all the externalities that are burdened on the earth and the people around uh, where any of the power has been made. If you'd actually fully factored all those costs, solar's been cheaper for a decade. We were finally recognizing that clean energy is dramatically less expensive and is becoming much, much lower as time goes on. With our technology, we're looking at a a pathway where you can take garbage, something you pay to get rid of right now, and turn it into clean energy that's actually carbon negative. And the cool thing about doing this, about taking this waste and making clean energy, is that it's profitable. I gotta tell you, the, 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 the keynote speaker, John, when he was saying this at the very beginning, and that is it's companies, not government. And that is, you show companies a regulation that's gonna make them clean things up, they'll hire lobbyists and waste decades you show them a way that they can make the world a better place while making a profit, they'll change overnight. That's our focus as a company. We're finding a way so it's profitable for businesses and communities to clean things up because they're going to make a profit, 
making clean energy. That's our focus. Thank you. Um, so generation of clean energy um, coupled with really storage now is, is um, you know, we've got Elon Musk coming out with his battery soon. Um, and when you have this, you remove the intermittency issue. Um, David, can you speak a little bit about bat battery storage? I think you could, um, given, given your work in Yellowstone, and uh, talk a little bit about the microgrid you built there. Sure. So when, we, when we're talking about getting to a zero emissions vehicle, <coughs> generally, uh, given the technology that we have available and, and, and what we know at, at this point in time, we're talking about vehicle electrification in, in different ways. And primarily through energy storage on board on the vehicle. And uh, more recently, we're talking about having uh, vehicles that can produce energy from hydrogen using hydrogen fuel cells and then um, use that electricity you know, to move the cars. In, in all those situations, we do have storage on the vehicle. There's always, uh, there's, there's batteries in the MIDI as well as the, all the, the electrical vehicles, the pure plug-in type electrical vehicles, as well as on the hybrid vehicles. And all of those vehicles are, are far advanced with regards to, you know, fuel efficiency and emissions uh, compared to what we have. But that presents us with another problem, which is that's a lot of, you know, when you, we, we have over 10 million uh, hybrid vehicles uh, that Toyota has put on the roads in the world. And we realized uh, some time ago that that's a lot of batteries that are, that are out there, you know, and we need to figure out what, what are we going to do with that. And so we developed uh, uh, recycling uh, means and methods and technologies and, and, and ways for people to bring those things back and turn those in and make sure that they're handled properly. And uh, along the way, then, once we'd established that, we determined we need to find, if we can, a way to take advantage of whatever power might be available in the battery, because it's, it's no different than a battery that you might have, you know, in your smoke detector at home, and then that starts beeping. And you can take that battery out and put it in your remote control and use it for another nine months, you know, so you can repurpose that a little bit. So that's sort of... With that type of thinking, that's how we've approached uh, recovering the batteries for see if we can find a beneficial end use. And we, we've actually um, found, uh, here we go. <laughs> and this is an actual battery pack um, that has been repurposed. And we introduced these packs and developed a system uh, in a place in uh, Yellowstone National Park, working with the National Park Service at the Lamar Buffalo Ranch. Um, the Lamar Buffalo Ranch is, is uh, completely grid independent. There's no utilities of any kind uh, at the at the site, and we were able to um, uh, work with some of our partners to develop a renewable energy source, which in this case was uh, solar, and um, develop a, a, a storage uh, component using recovered uh, Camry hybrid batteries, and develop a system there that provides 100% of the power, 100% of the time, using uh, uh, renewable energy in the form of solar energy in this case, and, uh, and recovered uh, hybrid batteries. What's interesting to note is, um, as we look at w what this means, you know, we, we have estimated that uh, the batteries that we're recovering currently in the United States have as much as four megawatts of storage capacity that can be deployed and used in places like this. So, um, and also you can see here, this is this is a small village here that's being powered. There's 14 buildings and um, usually around 30 people there. So this is the kind of thing we believe we can repurpose these batteries and other components that already have all of the carbon and, and all of the, the energy embodied in them and use them for purposes like this, and maybe get another, you know, seven, eight, ten years of life out of these. So it's, it's an energy saving component. It's a green energy component, and you know, we're, it's uh, and it's something that we can uh, put out there to any any place. You, you see the harsh environment here. We think this is something we can do anywhere, and we're continuing to work on that. Great, thank you. It's an amazing project. Um, so before we go on, I'm just going to read a few facts to you about 
clean energy solutions. Um, Shift has its offices in uh, Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, LACI, um, which is a, an incubator that nurtures uh, clean technology startups and is one of the most exciting uh, incubators in the country. In fact, we just did a series for Mashable called The Incubator. I highly recommend everybody watch it. Um, it's, it's terrific. But here's some facts uh, uh, about clean energy solutions that, um, that, that I think are worth noting. Uh, the cost of renewable energy and energy efficiency, batteries and storage, is dropping dramatically. Uh, another fact, in many parts of the world, renewable energy is already cheaper than fossil fuel. In some developing regions of the world, renewable energy is leapfrogging fossil fuels altogether. And a record $286 billion was invested, so we're not talking about profits, we're talking about investment in renewable energy in 2015, more than double that of fossil fuels. Um, I, I read a report uh, from the Advanced Energy Economy, uh, which is a trade organization, that clean energy is now as big as pharmaceutical manufacturing in the U.S. That's all phenomenal news. Um, and I think we've all can agree that we're in the midst of a clean energy economy right now, and, or a transition into, into one, which is an exciting thing. Um, but there are barriers. Um, we have an entrenched uh, group of fossil fuel industry uh, people who are hanging on tooth and nail to the old uh, paradigm. Uh, utilities have a monopoly. Regulators are afraid of the reliability factor. Um, and there are real barriers. And I, I'd like to ask Abigail, what, what, what can we do, how do we combat this? Well, let me, let me elaborate on some of the barriers which um, you've laid out some of the most important and, and then hopefully give some sense of how I think we can combat them because we, we are in the new world. 10 years ago, I could have sat here before you and said this will be economic, it, the technology will come. We don't have to say that anymore, it's here. Um, and so I think the barriers are political, they're cultural, and they're regulatory. And let me unpack that a little bit. The, the political is one you've touched on. Fossil fuels have a funny way of not distributing wealth very equally. And um, I think that's reflected in the billionaire cabinet that we see in running the government right now. Deep fossil fuel interests there, and they're not going to let go of their power, so to speak, easily. Um, cultural, you touched on this too. Keeping the lights on is crucial, and, and the way that we've known how to do that for over a century is with fossil fuels, with big hub power plants that spoke out in transmission lines. It's, it's a way of turning um, the lights up and down that we're very familiar with. It's a, oil is a way of fueling cars that we're very familiar with. I think whether it's utilities or the automobile industry, everyone understands the world is changing, but no one's quite sure how they're going to make money in the new paradigm. And so while we have this climate imperative to move change as quickly as we can, there is this resistance on the part of industry to delay the inevitable as long as possible. And what that translates into is regulatory barriers. All of the rules of the road that govern the choices about what, how we make energy, how we use energy, what powers our homes and our cars, those are all subject to rules that favor fossil fuels. But that's something we can change, um, and it's something that everyone in this room can be a part of. The reason why we are, are, you know, continue to rely on coal, even in Los Angeles, are because the people who make decisions about energy, for the most part, work in very obscure arenas called energy commissions, but they are locally accountable places, and they are places where public interest interveners, whether it's um, a, a local group or a big national group like the Sierra Club, who I sometimes represent, or you know, a, a neighborhood group who, who really cares about how much their bills cost, whether they have programs that let them um, weatherize their homes and be more comfortable, um, who care about whether there's fracking in their, in their backyard that's powering a gas-fired power plant rather than um, bringing clean energy jobs into their communities. All of these people are allowed a stake in trial-like proceedings, we can have our Perry Mason moment where we show that clean energy is in fact the economic alternative and the viable alternative to fossil fuels. And that's what we're doing right now in energy commissions across the state so, uh, and, and, and across the country and even in um, other countries like India. 
Great, thank you. Um, so in talking about this new economy, um, we have this incredible opportunity to create infrastructure, to create new jobs. Um, in, in so many instances, um, that opportunity is there and, and to help build and employ you know, folks in, in this new economy. Michelle, can you speak a little bit to you know, how you help people from low-income communities and those being displaced, um, get, get, getting the skill sets to them to participate in this? Yeah, I want to talk about these two things, clean air and good jobs, that so many think are mutually exclusive, right? Because uh, we all deserve clean air and good jobs. We should have both. We should have good health and thriving communities, safe communities. So um, what we see is there are, there are sort of, I'm going to lay out two kind of things I'm seeing, right? There's frontline communities, low-income communities, communities of color, who live in some of the poorest, most polluted areas. They're affected by the fossil fuel industry. They've got the most at stake in this green economy thing working out, right? They've got the most at stake of us getting below two degrees because in the meantime, they are in the heat islands attracting all of the superstorms and the fires and the floods and all of that. They have the most at stake. And then we have a green economy growing and creating all these job opportunities, right? It's like the hugest industry. We all got to get in now. Now is, now is what's going to create the wealth for the next generations, right? Um, when you think about Wall Street and tech and, you know, it's the green economy now. So how do we bridge these two things? Well, the green economy naturally starts with early adopters. You got to get something to market. Let's go for the early adopters. How do we get people in electric vehicles when they're not so cheap at first, right? And so then it becomes to have this brand around it as something that is elitist, something that isn't reachable or attainable, not accessible and obscure. We have to change that. We have to build a broader tent of support for climate policies and a broader tent of support for green solutions that make it real for the people who have the most at stake to see their place in this movement. Going back to something you said earlier, Mike, uh, you said, you know, companies, if we just tell them what to do through regulation, they're going to throw all this money at lobbyists, and we definitely see that, right? And you said if you can convince industry that they're actually going to make money out of this, then we have a different conversation, a different starting place. Well, for those of us in this room who care about the environment, right, we all came to this Environmental Media Association event, if you own a green business, it is absolutely a business case for how you get the green economy to, to get to broad-based adoption as fast as possible. Um, and I want to share, so Green for All is working on this, okay? We are trying to get you more money to fuel your industry because it's good for all of us. And so our executive director, Vien Trung, helped to win the largest fund in history here in California, taking proceeds from a price on carbon, right, so we're making polluters pay, and driving investments, prioritizing those investments for families on the front lines first. It's doing things like bringing electric van poles to migrant farm worker towns that haven't had established bus lines. It's doing things like bringing solar into affordable housing and apartment buildings. And so that's how we start to, you know, invest in growing the green economy where it matters most. And now we're looking at, you know, how do we do this across the country? There are states already on the West Coast, the West Coast is holding it down, I'm so proud. <laughs> in Oregon, Washington, you know, in California, looking at how to do this. New York is now looking at how do we leverage proceeds from their cap and trade system to do this. Um, but there's more that we can do. And there are lots of ideas, um, for how to overcome a lot of these barriers, whether it's how to afford, you know, energy efficiency upgrades, how to afford electric vehicles. We just need to fund the solutions. So we're pricing the pollution to fund the solutions. Great. Um, so we're seeing in the private sector, things are working great. You know, we can follow the, the investment, we can follow the money trail and see that that's those, it's just happening, which is terrific. Um, in, the, in the public sector, um, we, we need a cooperation between public and private, obviously, for this to, to work. It's, it's something that everyone's been talking about in this space for a long time. Um, but currently, uh, we're about to watch our policy go backwards. Um, and 
at best, there's a great deal of uncertainty. Just last week, uh, the scientific study of climate has, was cut altogether. Uh, 3,200 jobs, 3,200 jobs at the EPA were slashed and cut. Um, how are we going to address the issue in the public sector now? And uh, I'm gonna address this to Abigail, but I think I, I would open it also after that up to, to everyone here on the panel. Well, one of the things that gives me hope is that you have an investment community that, that has enough at stake to actually get involved um, politically, but these are new industries and they haven't been plowing their money into, I think, the power building and the political work that they need to do. Um, the wind industry, I think, is most mature and, um, you know, it's really interesting, the jobs that you're seeing, um, the wealth that's being cre created is, is in red states predominantly. Um, and so you start to see bipartisan support for wind. We need that to happen for solar. We're in the midst of wars over whether to roll back solar, solar po policy or get to the next iteration that's gonna work for business, that's gonna work for communities. Um, and this is the time that investors really matter. Um, it, it's gonna, this is one issue where I think the politics around climate are toxic, but the politics around investment and jobs are not. And so this is a time for the investment community to step up and get very political fast because their investments depend upon it. Uh, briefly, I, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree, but I'd also like to point out um, what Terry had said earlier um, when he was speaking about the whole point that when he was speaking with the, the president, he was talking about how turning waste to recycling or clean end products is a way to create jobs. And the really cool thing about garbage is it's exactly where people happen to live. It's amazing. There's a direct correlation where people live. We make mounds of garbage. And that's also where we demand clean energy and finished products. And so the opportunity in the 19,000, some almost 20,000 communities in the United States, they all make garbage. And there's an opportunity in every one of those communities to take their waste, recycle it, and turn it into not just energy and products, but jobs. And that's the way you change policy. That's the way when people see the opportunity to create jobs in their communities, they light up. If I might just very briefly, President Obama did a really nice thing. He gave me a big award and he basically said, would you do me a favor? He didn't actually say personally, but he said, would you go speak down at the Delta Regional Authority? Delta Regional Authority is some of the poorest communities in America. They have all the, the Delta, the Mississippi. And I gave a speech down there and explained what our technology could do. And I said our small system that we've developed with the Army would create about 12 jobs, 12 full-time, you know, good-paying jobs for each one of these systems, and they could take care of a community of about 25,000 people. When we were done, I had a line stretching around the stage and down the hall of mayors, city managers, and county supervisors saying, you have no idea what 12 good paying jobs would do for our community. It would be transformative. We have hundreds of these people that have all said, we need these kind of jobs in our communities. This is a real thing. This could transform places by taking something we throw away that makes methane that goes into the atmosphere, 84 times worse than carbon dioxide, but that's the way you change policies is by giving people jobs that matter. We're talking about close to a quarter of a million jobs across this country. Is just, just jump in for, it's such a complex issue. I was trying to think of where to jump in. Um, it was expensive to, to live proper, to live green. Um, when I sold, I, I lived for 10 years, I lived for 10 years off, off the grid. When I drive my electric plug-in, I drive off the grid, really true, clean energy. Um, but it was expensive. And um, uh, Edison is currently going negotiating with, with all of us to lower what we get back, so it's becoming more expensive. In fact, today, uh, panels are coming down, but the energy buyback from the from the carriers is getting bigger. You know, the, you got to look at the economy f for individuals too. Uh, being a guy on the street, we I started out with a very a group of zealots that bought these cars, like I mentioned vaguely, and then it was the celebrities, and we did the first Academy Award green carpet and showed people there. And then it was um, the masses came. And now, when gas was at $5 a gallon, y'all lined up to come see me. At 250, everybody kind of disappeared. I'm, my phone is still there. Um, but it's interesting, you know, it's gotta make sense for them. So at, at, at 250 a gallon, 
you got to be really careful what you what you spend and what and what's going to what's going to engage people to come out and want to be green. It's got, so it's it's even more complex because you got to take it to the street. The investors have to do it if they can see a return. Um, private sector has to see some sort of logic to it, but consumers have to see it. And when gas went basically in half, uh, it changed that dynamic. So it's, it was really a yet another um, fascinating aspect of it. We had these great rules where the, the manufacturers that I deal with had to get to a certain place by 2025. And there's some talk about them. I don't think they'll, I don't think they'll come down. I don't think they'll go as high as they should have gone. And, and I think they'll be cut back, personal opinion, from being fairly involved. And I, so I don't, they're going to get, they're going to get pulled back, but the consumer isn't buying these cars voluntarily. They're having to be subsidized. You know, Teslas are 7,500 fed, 2,500 fed, uh, state, and cap and trade that supports the company. So, so it's a really interesting dynamic to make it relevant for them. And I think oftentimes we look at all of great points. You got to look at what, what's going to make sense to investors and businesses, but then what's going to make sense to consumers? And we're missing that point right now. That, 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 thank you. Uh, that was actually the question I was going to ask you, but you, you, you answered it before I could ask it. <laughs> um, David, you, you, so you built a mini smart grid. Um, do you think we lack the political will to build more and more smart grids? Where, where are we right now with regard to um, the development of smart grids across our country? I do believe we lack the political will. Um, I think the large en energy companies are going to continue to lobby against uh, distributed energy. It's obviously not in their best interest, although it's in all of our best interest. Um, and I don't see anything uh, that really encourages me. Uh, however, <laughs> individuals uh, have the capability uh, today to uh, find different ways to adopt their own little mini smart grids right at home. And, you know, so it may not be uh, subsidized, it may not be incentivized, and it may not be easy, but it, but it's, it's doable. And even, you know, we have some very large operations and we've made a commitment and we're not gonna back away from it to get to zero carbon by 2050. And so we're having to look at all the various elements, including self-generation on our sites, in order to achieve that. And we're starting down that path. And uh, we intend to continue to lobby for uh, distributed generation and uh, owned generation and, and all of those things. And, and um, so you know, that's the voice that we're bringing uh, to the table to, to support that. I'll say one thing about political will. Um, Trump has been a blessing and a curse in a way, right? In a lot of respects, he's rolling back everything that we care about on environmental issues. He's attacking the clean power plan. He's cutting EPA's budget. He's putting uh, industry folks like Scott Pruitt in office or, you know, to head the EPA. But he's also helped to start to bring people together. People who were not engaged before are now outraged, right? And they want to do something. So what is the something that they can do? And so I think that while he has been a little bit of a curse, um, we can use this and, and see the silver lining here and say, okay, cool. What are we gonna do then? Because he's only one guy. Are we really gonna give him all that power and just sit back and watch what happens? Or are we gonna get in the game here and work together to help shift the climate conversation so that we are driving this and moving it forward? And I'll say, that really starts with how we're gonna shift this conversation to one that is inclusive and that drives with fighting climate different by putting front lines first. That's how we're gonna build a bigger tent. That's how we're gonna move forward. So we're, we're gonna save humanity. We are. This is it. This panel is going to save humanity with clean energy. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I think it's it's lunchtime right now, and I don't want everyone to uh, miss the, uh, the the lunch meal. So <laughs> one one thing. Go ahead. Go so ahead. if you are if you are listening to this and you say I do want to get in the game, what can I do? Join us. So Vans recorded a, a invitation to you all at frontlinesfirst.org. You can join us to take the pledge to put Frontlines first and, and work with us in this movement. Great. A call to action. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This, is, this, this was terrific. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs>